I talk with a prolific writer and humorist who's won the Stephen Leacock Award three times, more than any other Canadian writer, Merrick Nickel. But first, I climb into the big pool with world-class swimmer and human being Elaine Tanner. She's won seven gold and seven silver medals. We are all born wet. It seems that Elaine Tanner just didn't dry off for 18 years. The original E.T. was born in Vancouver in 1951. And when she joined the Dolphin Swim Club, she started out on an adventure that would have her name in headlines for eight years. In the mid-60s, she held many world records, including the 100 and 200 meter backstroke. At the 1966 Commonwealth Games, she won four gold and three silver medals. Her performance at the 68 Olympics won her two silver and a bronze. But many felt, including Elaine, that she had buckled under the pressure, which was always there from the age of 10 when not a day went by when she wasn't swimming. My mom really loves swimming, and so we spent a lot of time around the water, and I was just natural at it. I was just like a water baby, I guess. And uh, I remember learning how to swim, and they, they said, pretend like we're ducks, yes. and we'd dive to the bottom for pennies, and I thought this was so much fun. So I've always loved the water. It's been a natural element for me. And uh, I used to, when we moved to California, I used to watch the competitive swimmers go up and down. And I'd say to myself, I know how to do that. I could figure out how to do that. So I taught myself butterfly and backstroke, and... And then my mom said, well, you better take swimming lessons. And I said, no, nah, Mom, I know how to swim. Of course, my mom won. I'm glad, I'm glad she did, because when I took lessons, the, the instructor immediately said, she's Olympic potential material. He recognized that right off. I was eight years old. You swam with the Dolphin Club? Yes, right. Howard Furry was my coach. He was the best coach in Canada, the best technical coach. And, and we got along really well. We had a wonderful rapport. He understood me. I understood him. And he trained me. And then at a swim meet, he knew that he could just let me go. I didn't need mm -hmm. to get psyched up because I could do that myself. In a race, it was what I used to do was create a visualization before a race. I would go through the whole thing. I didn't know at that time what it was called, but I did it automatically. And I would know exactly what I wanted to do, what my split times were for each length. Because I trained so much, I knew how fast I was going pretty well, almost to within a second. And uh, I would... I would know, I would say to myself, I'm winning this race, I'm winning this race. And uh, I wanted to lead right from the beginning. That's the, my strategy, is I didn't want to be behind at all. And, and I had a lot of endurance, so I never had to worry if I was out in front that I would stay there. Your parents must have been dedicated to you swimming. They were very dedicated. My dad, every morning before work, he'd get up and take me to the pool, back, and then we'd all have breakfast, and off he'd go to work, and they'd watch every evening when I'd swim. And the thing is, they never pushed me. They always said, Elaine, if it's not fun anymore, don't do it. You know, you don't have to do it for us. You do it for yourself. Is that why at the age of 18 you said, that's it? Well, I think so. There was quite a few different things that I had to consider, but there was a lot of pressure put on me. At that time, it was every race I went into, everyone expected me to win. and. It's fun climbing to the top. It's fun saying, I want to beat her, and I want to beat her. And you set yourself goals. When you start beating everybody, everybody wants to beat you. And instead of concentrating on, I want to, I want to win, I want to win, it's like, I don't want to lose. Because everybody's trying to beat you. Mm -hmm. And there's a real difference in the mentality. And it becomes more work that way. And after I quit swimming, I really felt for quite a long time, uh, at odds with myself. I didn't really know what to do. And uh, that was a difficult transition. And they don't, they do now, but at that time, they didn't help athletes in counseling them and saying that, you know, there's life after swimming or life after track or whatever. And uh, that, I had concentrated so much on the Olympic Games, on that one race, that I kind of forgot there was life after it. And it took me a while to really get going again. The 68 Olympics. You were expected to win, were you not? They said before the Olympics that Elaine Tanner could win, hands tied behind her back. And there was a lot of pressure. And uh, when I didn't win, it was Elaine Tanner lost the gold medal. And it wasn't that I won two silvers and a bronze. And it was a good accomplishment. But at that time and for many years after, really for almost 20 years after that, I felt that I'd let Canada down and I'd let myself Bookie down and my parents. And, and then in retrospect, better. now when I put it into perspective, the most important thing really is to really have fun and to know that you can achieve. And it's not the event that you focus on, but it's you as a person. And knowing that when you put yourself to something, to the test, that you can do it. And it's not a gold, silver, bronze that really counts. It's really how you feel inside about yourself.
Elaine is currently working on new business ventures and lapping everyone at the Vancouver Aquatic Center. I can swim one length to her three. Four. Eric Nickel is a writer with a finely tuned sense of the ridiculous. He knows how to turn a phrase, paint it with a dab of wry wit, and use it to tickle the funny bone. For years, he was a columnist for both the Vancouver Sun and the province newspapers. Family life and children were most often the subjects of his columns. Always painting himself as the loser, the underdog, he was able to make readers identify and sympathize with him, and his fans became legion. I graduated from the university during the Depression, and so I was very aware of the need for a career, and writing wasn't it. There was no creative writing or anything at that time. So I was going to be a teacher, and I took honors in French, and then uh, got some awards, and after the war, as I was... Well, lost three years there. Uh, I did go to Paris uh, for the try to get the doctorate at the University, which is their their doctorate for for foreigner students. And I spent a year in uh, in Paris and uh, attending the Sorbonne. But I spent most of my time in the Bibliothèque Nationale writing columns for the province because it was more fun. I I'm not a scholar. I found that out. That was the learning experience there. I don't, I'm mentally handicapped because I don't have a good memory. I don't have a scholar's memory. I enjoy entertaining people, and I always have. I, I started writing in the column uh, in the, uh, at the university uh, for the university paper at the UBC. I wrote under a pseudonym because I was pretty shy. But I would used to sneak into the library on the day the paper came out and watch the faces of the kids reading the paper until they got to my column and then I'd watch to see whether they laughed or smiled or whatever. And if they did, well, I felt that I'd done it. If they didn't, well, I hadn't done it. It was a pretty good objective test. Most of your columns in those days were personal about you and your family, things that happened in your family. They really fall into the genre of personal essay as if it were not in the newspaper. Uh, it is the personal essay type of stuff. If you put it in athletic terms, I guess you'd say I was a sprinter rather than a marathoner because I've tried a novel once or twice and it doesn't work out too well. You've been labeled a satirist. Would you call yourself a satirist? Well, sometimes it's satire and sometimes it's humor. And as you know, there's a difference. Humor is warm, satire is cold. What I found out about Canadian, the Canadian public, reading public, or even theater public, is that they don't really enjoy or appreciate satire. The satire is not just lampooning. Lampooning, making fun of individuals and uh, Aristophanes, really, that's uh, lampooning. But satire is something that is a, is a hit at the entire society, everybody. And when people in an audience or in a reading public feel that they are the objects of the satire, especially in Canada, they have a tendency to say, oops, uh, and who does this guy think he is? He's just a Canadian the same as I am. Whereas the English people will take satire knowing who they are and uh, they don't feel that there's any threat. We suit, I think we do. So the humor pieces that I write, you know, the personal family stuff, is what is most welcomed. The other I keep trying the land, trying the ground, seeing if I can get away with it, and most often I don't. I think the French Canadians are much more ready to accept wit or satire than the English Canadians are. Are you a funny guy in person? No, no. Funny as a rubber crutch. It's, uh, no, not. What do you Definitely like? not. What do you like? What am I like? What do you like? Yeah, what, how would you describe yourself? Preposterously dull. Really, enormously dull. Um, <laughs> it's pathetic. <laughs> it's, it really is. I've been such, led such a straight, square life. I feel it's been one of the big inhibiting factors in my creative career because... Uh, I guess it was the way I was brought up, but I was brought up to be uh, conscious of social responsibility. Of course, that is absolutely fatal to anybody who's trying to do something in the arts. And you can't get rid of that? I, I've been, tried to shake it off several times, but it still sticks around. <laughs> it's, well, I keep trying a great variety of things. It, it, one thing about being a writer retired is you can kid yourself you're still effective forever and ever. If you're an athlete, you can't. But you can, as a writer, you you know you think you can still think you still think you, you still got it. <laughs> the biggest kick I think is the theater. I've done a few stage plays because there the response is magnified and immediate. When you go into a theater as a playwright and hear and see people really enjoying themselves, laughing, <laughs> it's, it's it's a thrill. It's very very hard to top. You have any regrets at all, Eric? No, I don't, I don't have any serious regrets about um, my career uh, at all, such as it is. I think of myself as a, as a minor talent, 
that has probably done as much as he can with uh, with what he was blessed with. And um, I don't regret staying, not staying in London, because this is my country. I've always loved Canada, and uh, I've tried to do the best I can here. And uh, I'm reasonably satisfied that I have done reasonably well. What makes me feel good when, is when some person comes up to me and says, I gave your book to my friend who's in hospital, and uh, they got a chuckle out of it. Okay, that's good enough. That'll do. First, I'd like you to meet the gentle giant, Emery Barnes. For years, he hit on people in the CFL. What he did physically, he now does verbally as an NDP member in Victoria. Emery Barnes has had quite a life. He was born December the 15th, 1929, in the southern U.S. He was a big kid who took to football as a way of escaping a life of inner city entrapment. His family finally moved to Portland, and following graduation and after a stint with the NFL, Emory signed on with the BC Lions in 1957. And for seven years, this gentleman pounded on people. Now, 16 years into a political career, Emory hasn't forgotten his roots. Let us start at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Right. Louisiana. What part of Louisiana? New Orleans. Which uh, must have meant that music was part of your life from day one, because that city is all music. Yeah, I think those are the first sounds I can recall listening to, and they were sort of subconscious. It seems like on every street corner you could hear, you know, foot stomping and, and chants, and uh, it's just the way it was. Music was... Even. Everything was rhythmic, even even, even with the all funerals. of those. Even the funerals. Everywhere. You go into a little bar and they would think the joint would be jumping. You go to church and the joint was jumping. Tell me about your, your family. How, how large was it? Your mom and dad? Not large. Hmm. I had my mother and my sister. My sister is a year older than I am. And my father, I really can't say I knew him. I, I saw my father perhaps two or, two or three times in my life, and I was preschool. Huh. Those were preschool years. What do you remember about your time with, with the BC Lions? There was one occasion when, I, uh, I believe it was Saskatchewan, when we were playing a game at Empire Stadium, and uh, Neil Beaumont intercepted a, a, a pass. Uh, and uh, he was in his end zone, way back in his end zone, I think someplace, maybe about uh, 10 yards deep in his own end zone. But he, um, when he intercepted, I just happened to catch him. I was on the field at the same time. I happened to catch him in the side of my eye that he made this interception. I began to look for a, a lane to run. Yeah. And fortunately, he saw me as I was looking. Somehow we got together. It was just the right time in history for us to be together on thinking. And he picked up on my stride, and we ran and managed to go all the way for a touchdown, which was a, at that time, was a Canadian record. I think it still stands. That's right. See, I'm pleased about that. It's one of those rare plays that you get a chance to do something that uh, will stick. Was your mom proud of you? Very much so, yeah, and vice versa. Everything I think about, you know, I used to, give, I used to see her because she was a rock, like a, a solid believer, hard-working person, she didn't have a mean bone in her body except when I challenged her authority. <laughs> then Ooh. I found out how rough she was. I mean, otherwise she was a very loving lady. But uh, I learned early that uh, she was running the show. But she, she carried my sister and I, you know, quite a way. The big turning point for Emery Barnes came when he and partner Gary Locke, representing Vancouver Center for the NDP, were elected in the 1972 provincial election as MLAs. Emery is still there. You know, I want to write, I want to explore, I want to see the world. Uh, I would still like to be a musician one day. I'd like to get to know my family even better. I'm now a grandfather. I've got a, a grandson. I may even go back and get a real education, even though I've got two degrees. You know, like <laughs> I've learned that I don't know as much as I would like to know about things. And life is exciting. Every day that I wake up and I discover that I'm alive and that what I thought was hard times is really just a matter of perspective, I began to say, hey, I'm really glad that I'm able to experience this. This is really something, and that's why I cherish life. And I, you know, I think that people, people quite often get beaten by circumstance because they, their view is too narrow. There's a lot of high points in my life. You know, all my children, every time I look at them and really look at them, I say, hey, you know, that's pretty great. I got four of them. We don't look at them enough. Uh, and uh, it's being here right now uh, in the legislature, and I sometimes think, you know, this is, this is, you're very fortunate to be, to have an opportunity to, to serve, to give, to live out your, 
to have a chance to make some of the things happen that you're thinking about. It's a long way from New Orleans. A long, long way from New Orleans. 